Hello, I am Katrick and today I'm making this video for the Construct2 Academy. The project we are going to work with today is about isometric rendering. We do have a main character that is currently moving, the brown thingy. Enemies characters, the zombies, which are flashing right now. The flash means that they are aggroed, so they have been in range, in line of sight view of the main character and are currently following it. The main character is moving into an isometric grid and as you can see can't move across obstacles. It would go behind and in front according to the depth. We do have several views available to us and several possibilities. In the current view I can use the arrow keys to move my camera around and I use the numeric keypad to move the main character. You can notice on the left a grid and if I press the V key to change the view I'm in grid mode only because actually this is a grid that determines the type of terrain to render, the character's positions and so on. And here is a strictly isometric view where the camera is focusing and following my character. On the current video we are going to focus on the enemies, how to make them move and how to handle their AI. For the isometric rendering used in this video please refer to the video on the terrain rendering as the theory will be about the same. For the basic setup of the characters and the basics of the movement, please refer to the video about basic grid movement. In this video, we will focus on the enemies, which are instances of the same object type, and see how we handle the basic AI and automated movement. Check the tile enemy object and notice it contains a behavior line of sight and a pathfinding behavior as well, plus a timer behavior. The movement will be handled thanks to the pathfinding. I strongly recommend to read, possibly a couple of times, the manual article about the pathfinding behavior if you are not familiar with it. The goal of this behavior is to consider the layout as a grid and check cells to determine a way free of obstacles the object should be able to move going from a cell to another. To fit the grid we built, the setup must be set so that the cell size property of the pathfinding behavior is 32, the size of our tile instances. The obstacles are set to custom and determined thanks to the set obstacle actions when creating the enemies in the create enemies function. As mentioned in the comments, if you are creating manually your levels, you will still need to add those actions at some point in your code. On start of a layout could make it. With that configuration we are good to go and use the pathfinding behavior. Not that we won't use its moving abilities, but strictly use its calculation and path storing ability. When a path is calculated thanks to the action find path, an array in the behavior holds a series of coordinates through the various cells the path moves through. We will take advantage of that. Instead of having the player setting the direction in which to move, like it was done in the last part for the main character object, we will have our enemies walking through the cells calculated in the pathfinding behavior. Nevertheless, we still rely on the same grid movement we used before for the main character, with some modifications though, since we are not waiting on the user's input. The theory is to randomly determine a cell of our grid as final destination for our enemy. Like for the main character, we do not want this cell to contain an obstacle though. Then we calculate, find the path to this tile. Remember this calculation is done in the tile layer where our grid and our tile enemy object 
are standing. Once the path is found, it is composed of several nodes, intermediary cells, the way to the final cell goes through. So we want to apply our grid movement through those several cells. Once the final cell is reached, the enemy is arrived, will be left for a few seconds idling and then will pick a new destination and move to a random destination again. This is our basic movement. In addition to that, we also have the line of sight behavior, which has the same obstacles as the pathfinding behavior and will be used to determine if the main character is ever in range of view of the enemy. If it is, we will pass our enemy in a state of aggro and set it to follow the character instead of randomly moving around. That's for the theory. Now to check the code itself. See how in the function create enemies, the final action is to set the next move time to the instance created. Again, if you manually set your level, you will have to manually set this action as well to initiate the movement AI of the enemies. Then we see in the position characters projection start function, you notice we start by creating the enemy's projection, tying them to their respective tile enemy object by keeping the UID in instance variables. This will be useful for the handling picking later. We set movement speed, like for the main character, although the speed is reduced in regards. I wanted the zombie's enemies to move slower than the main character. At the end of the function, set z enemy is pretty much the same as set z player looping through each instance of proj enemy to order them appropriately in depth as you can see in the comment of that function this is not actually complete you could add more ordering to prevent proj player and proj enemy instances to overlap inappropriately i will leave it up to you as mentioned, I did my best to keep the project under 100 events so it can be edited, so get rid of events you don't need and complete this function at your will. From this point, the logic of the code is followed in the event 78 when the timer next move triggers. The goal of the event is to set a destination cell for the enemy. Two sub-events are checked to determine what will be this destination, either a random cell for a random movement or, if the enemy is aggro, it means that it has seen the main character, setting the current cell of the main character as the destination. The function moveEnemy is called with the logic coordinates of the cell. MoveEnemy does use the find path action of the pathfinding behavior and sets the past cell coordinates as final destination. When the path is found, Set dest enemy function is called, which purpose is to determine what is currently the next cell the object needs to move to. To do so, it explores the pathfinding nodes, which store the layout coordinates to the next cell and get the appropriate tile instance thanks to those coordinates. Once found, it sets the logic coordinate dest x and dest y and set the tile enemy instance boolean variable moving to true. This is very much like the grid movement for our main character. So logically, the next event to check is event 70 that checks when the boolean variable moving is true and will be checked every tick. Again, this is pretty similar to the main character movement. So be sure to refer to the previous video and or comments if you need further information. The main difference is, once the intermediary cell is reached, a few more checks are done. We check if the enemy was newly aggroed, that is to say, if between the previous cell and the current one, it found itself in range of seeing the main character. If it did, we forget the current final destination and set a new one by having a next move time trigger rapidly that will take the current tile the main character is on as destination. If it wasn't a grow and there are still pathfinding nodes to go through, we then navigate in the node count and call the set dest enemy function so that it sets the next node as next intermediary destination. Finally, it wasn't a grow and there are no more nodes to navigate, it reached its final destination. We reset the values, 
we will idle the enemy for a while by calling the next move timer after 3 seconds. The last event of our event sheet, event 81, handles the aggro management that is integrated in the movement as we have just seen. Like for set Z enemy, it uses a for each loop. And like all the previous events presented, which applied only to a specific instance because of the way they were triggered, this event has to be executed for all the instances of the object. And so, for each tile enemy object, every tick of execution, we check if the main character is in line of sight or not. If it is, and the enemy wasn't yet a grow, we set a few variables and have the approach enemy flash for feedback. In a true game, you will likely want something different, like using specific animations or playing a sound, displaying an icon over its head. You can also see that we set the loss of aggro to happen if the main character isn't in sight for more than 1.5 seconds. If this happens, the enemy will simply stop flashing, reach its destination cell and go back to picking a random destination. It is a simple yet efficient AI that handles movement and aggro quite easily. To sum up, pathfinding and line of sight are used in the tile layer. Grid movement, as seen for our main character, is applied to each enemy's instances as well as using the pathfinding calculated path to determine the destination. Line of sight is used to determine which destination cell our enemy is going for, either one occupied by the main character or a random one. That is a way of handling a simple AI yet efficient, and it is a way to apply it using C2's objects and behaviors and still have an isometric environment to display to the player. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Don't hesitate to check out some of the other Constructor Academy material. Thank you for watching.